All right, it looks like we're live. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Life Science Live this wonderful week. I'm trying to find the best place to set us. We're gonna move a little bit today, but not too far. And we're here in the Africa room today. There's a way to flip this. There we go. We're here in the Africa room today at the Bean Museum. And we're here because we are talking about antelopes. So you can see a couple antelope over here behind me. We have several species of antelope in the Africa room. One hiding there in the trees over there and one getting chased by a lion, <laughs> one getting eaten by a leopard. Being an antelope probably isn't the most exciting life out there, but it's very interesting. And so we're going to talk about some of those um, different antelope species and what makes them antelope, how they're different from other animals that are kind of closely related to them. And we're gonna start off by talking about a little bit of taxonomy. So taxonomy is one of my favorite things to talk about ever. I think it's super interesting and it's always really fun to see how, um, how scientists decide how to classify things. Um, I, I need to hold my little iPad, but I also need to set my phone down. <laughs> Maybe up here. Ooh, there we go. Okay, you get to look at the ceiling for a second while I get this situated. <laughs> All of the grass in the Africa room. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> so, just to start off and give us like a good basis for talking about taxonomy, we're going to look at some human taxonomy. And so I'm sure a lot of you learned throughout school what what taxonomy is. You probably remembered it with a little mnemonic like King Philip came over from Great Spain or something like that. So the order of things is kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. And so those are all just a bunch of groups that scientists are able to put animals into. And they start off really big. You have even, you can even start with a domain, a really big group of animals, and then work your way down to the smaller groups until you get to the species for just that individual um, type of animal or plant or any other living thing. So for humans, for example, uh, let the light adjust there, there we go. So we are in the kingdom Animalia, in the phylum Chordata, in the class Mam Mammalia, in the order Primates, the family Hominidae, the genus Homo, and then the species Homo sapiens. So when you tell, when you give a, a species, you give the genus, and the specific epithet, that's sapiens. But sapiens by itself wouldn't mean anything. You have to have the genus with it in order for it to make sense. It really doesn't want to focus on the, the screen this week. There we go. <laughs> All right, so that's how it works for humans. And it works the same way for all the other animals. And so I mentioned today we're talking about, um, about antelopes. An interesting thing about antelopes is that their classification is a little bit weird. So sometimes when taxonomists are putting things into groups, there's like a group of organisms that aren't technically related or not super closely related, but there are a lot of similarities about them. Um, usually when taxonomists put things together, they'll do it based on like the evolutionary phylogenetic tree. So depending on when something branched off and started to become different from animals that were closely related to it, and in the case of antelopes, there were a lot of different branches that happened, but there's a lot of like different opinions about where those branches happened because we can't always, we couldn't watch evolutionary history as it happened. Um, so sometimes taxonomists will create a group that they'll call a waste basket, ta waste basket taxon. And one example of those that you've probably heard of is invertebrates. So we have a big group of animals uh, it's, called, it's actually a subphylum that we belong to called vertebrata. So going back to our little human here, we have phylum chordata, and then there's a subphylum in there called vertebrata. And those are all the animals with a backbone. But there are a lot of different animals that don't have a backbone that also are related like in a lot of different ways. There's lots of different groups. They're kind of all over the place, but they all don't have a backbone. So we just call them invertebrates. And you can call that a wastebasket taxon. It's just sort of a group where we throw everything because it's convenient to talk about it that way, even though they're not technically 
closely related to each other. And antelope are one of those wastebasket taxon. So antelope are related to each other. And here's an example of how that works. Get that. There we go. So they're all in the kingdom Animalia, in the phylum Chordata, in the class Mammalia, in the order Artiodactyla, in the family Bovidae. But then there are just a ton of, whoa, <laughs> I'm gonna lose me there, a ton of subfamilies. This grass. <laughs> and antelope aren't in any one single subfamily. There's actually a lot of different subfamilies in Bovidae, and some of them are ones that you're probably really familiar with. Um, cows belong to Bovidae, and that's why you'll probably hear cows called bovine, because they actually belong to the subfamily Bovini. <laughs> There's a lot of words being thrown around, but just to make it a little easier, <laughs> here's a water buffalo and a heart of beast. These guys both belong to the same group as the cows. They belong to Bovini. Um, then you also have the goats and the sheep. They belong to Bovini. And you have all the antelope. <laughs> and they belong to Bovini as well. Um, and all of those animals, cows, sheep, goats, and antelope, they're the same in a lot of different ways. So all antelope and cows and sheep and goats <laughs> are ruminants, which means that they have special bacteria living in their gut that help them to digest their food. So they're all herbivores, they all eat plants. And plants have a lot of um, tough things in them that are hard to digest. And so in order to be able to digest those, um, those tough fibers in plants, uh, ruminants, like all the animals in Bovidae, have bacteria living in their gut that can break them down. And then they can extract the nutrients from them and get extra nutrients. <laughs> so it's sort of like, um, it, one easy way to think about it is that if you were to eat a salad, you would not gain weight. That's why a lot of people on diets eat a lot of salad because there are just nutrients in there that our bodies can't access because we don't have bacteria living in our gut to break it down for us. But ruminants do. So even uh, that zebra back there is a ruminant also. Um, actually don't listen to that. <laughs> I, they're, they're slightly different. Um, the wildebeest, but wildebeest back there is a ruminant. Um, and uh, they, they have those bacteria living in their gut that help them to break down um, things in a salad that allow them to gain weight from eating just plants. Um, another thing that makes them all the same is that they're all even-toed ungulates. So this is where we're gonna start moving around a bit. So an ungulate is an animal with a hoof. And these little um, gazelles here are gonna help us out. So here's their hoof. And you can see they've got two toes. So they're an even-toed ungulate. And if we look at some of our other antelope around here, these are some little dick dicks. You can see they've also got two toes. This Gerenuk here has two toes. So all those animals with hooves and an even number of hooves makes them an even-toed ungulate. But our zebra that I mentioned earlier, he's an odd-toed ungulate who belongs to a different group. He's just got one toe. <laughs> and the same for some of our other... Well, actually, if we come back, here's another um, even-toed ungulate. Two toes and then two more toes back there. So all the antelope. And then also if I had some sheep and goats and cows in here, you'd see they all have those cloven hooves, which makes them even-toed ungulates. So all antelope are the same in that way. Another thing that makes them all similar to each other, trying to get us to balance here, there we go, is their horns. So here in North America, have a lot of deer and elk and they are even-toed ungulates they have those split hooves but their antlers grow and then are shed every year but antelope like our animals here in Africa have horns that just grow and grow continuously and that's the same for all of the animals in Bovidae um, so this right here is a sable antelope horn. Um, you can see it's really long. It's attached to his skull down here and it'll just keep growing through his whole life without stopping until he dies. He's never gonna shed this 
The only time he would lose it is if it breaks somehow, um, but which happens because they often use these horns to fight and tussle with one another, especially the males. Um, but other than that, they're not going to go anywhere. They're just going to keep growing until he dies. And that's the case for all of Bovidi, like I said. Um, but one thing, so once we start getting into, um, I'm coming the wrong passage, here we go. Once we start getting into those subfamilies, there are some differences about, um, about each of the animals in Bovidi. So just as a reminder, all of them belong to the same family, but now we're getting into some different subfamilies. And so, Antelope are not cows, <laughs> but some, the bovini, the group that has the cows, and the wildebeest also has some antelope in it. So taxonomists have taken a few antelope because of the way that um, their, their specific characteristics that match with animals in other subfamilies, and they've thrown them into this wastebasket taxon called antelope. And one of them is the hartebeest. So this right here, I'll zoom in so you can see him a little better, is a hard beast. And you can see kind of how he looks like a cow. He has that stocky body and this sloping back, but he also has these long legs and um, just some behavioral characteristics that fit pretty well with the antelope. Um, so he belongs to a tribe, which is like a smaller group called Tregalophini. <laughs> so it's different from the cows, which belong to Bovini but it is similar to the antelope. So this right here is a hartebeest, um, a couple of hartebeest horns, a pair of hartebeest horns. And you can see they've got these bumps that you'll often find on antelope horns. And they're sort of curvy like antelope horns. And hartebeest are cool <laughs> because they live in Africa like most of the antelopes. Actually, out of all the antelopes in the world, most of them live in Africa. Um, and that's the case for all of the individual ones that I have for us today. Um, and, and the hartebeest is one of the ones that's really closest to the, being the biggest. Um, we also have one called an eland. That's the biggest antelope, and he belongs to the same group as the hartebeest and as the wildebeest back here. So hartebeests, wildebeests, and elands all belong to Bovini, the subfamily with cows. Let's see, we mentioned our sable antelope a minute ago because I was talking about the horns. So this one has huge horns and they slope back. And here's a picture of a sable antelope. There we go. So he has these really cool white markings on his face. Sable antelope live, I believe in East Africa. Yeah, in East Africa. And just like the rest of the antelope, their horns grow continuously. They have these long legs. Ooh, that's a different animal. <laughs> there we go. They have these long legs. They're really fast. And there are several different ways that antelope eat. So, well, two main ways I should say that antelope eat. So some of them are browsers, which means they pull leaves off of bushes and shrubs and trees. So they'll go around and kind of, most of them have like, um, mouths that are a little bit smaller and easier to like move around and so they can pick the leaves that they want. The rest of them are grazers which means they go out they usually have big mouths and they just take mouthfuls of mostly grass and like flowers and things that grow on the ground. And some of them are a mix of those two. Um, the sable antelope is almost exclusively a grazer and so you can see he's really big kind of has a broad face and that suits really well for grazing. If he had a smaller face, it'd be easier for him to get those little leaves and be a browser, but because he's so big, being a grazer is just just easier. Um, so the family, or the, the subfamily that he belongs to is not the cow subfamily. It's actually its own subfamily called Hippotragony. And that means, hippo means horse-like. And you can kind of see he looks a little horse shaped. And so that's where the name of that subfamily comes from. So another group that's separate from the, from the cow group completely, but he's still an antelope because he just fits better with his behavior and his appearance 
and the general structure of his body. And so taxonomists have put him into the antelope wastebasket, <laughs> and that's, that's how we talk about him. But antelope, because there are so many different subfamilies fitting into there, antelope come in a ton of different sizes and shapes. And so we have this little guy here, and this one is a steenbok. I'm trying to find my... Oh, here he is. <laughs> so the steenbok is a really small type of antelope, much smaller than the ones, especially like our hartebeest and our wildebeest and our elands. It's a little guy. <laughs> and so this right here is a steenbok skull. And you can see he's got these teeny little, little horns that are straight, very similar to our, um, our dick dicks over there in the corner, if you can see them hiding on the ground. There we go. And the steenbok belongs to a group, a subfamily called Antilopini. If I can get me to stay. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> and steenboks are browsers. So I mentioned that a lot of times this, with a smaller face, it's easier to be a browser, and that's the case for steenboks. So their faces are really small. They can fit in between the branches of shrubs and trees, and they'll pluck off those leaves and that works really well for them. <laughs> They're able to access the ones that are really low to the ground that some of those bigger antelope can't get to. They're able to weave their way between branches and browse on the leaves. All right, the next and the last um, set of antlers that are horns that I have, not antlers, <laughs> is from the Impala. So these are some of the really cool curvy ones that you'll find among antelopes. There are so many different shapes. Uh, here we go. <laughs> so here's a picture of an impala and the name of their subfamily that I'm not even going to try to pronounce. <laughs> and impala are kind of a mix between browsers and grazers. So depending on what's available, they might eat grass or they might get some of those leaves from shrubs and trees. And they're in sort of like a middle size range, so that works pretty well for them. I've got an impala over my head that I keep looking at. <laughs> so here's the underside of him. He's the one getting chased by the lion here at the museum. And so you can see he's bigger definitely than, than our Dick Dicks and Steenbox, but smaller than an Eland or those other ones. And I also just realized that I mixed up a couple of my families here. So we talked about the, um, the eland that belongs to Boveni. So this is, this is an eland. But the wildebeest that I mentioned at the same time actually belongs to a different family, not with the cows, um, called Alcelophinae. <laughs> Alcelophinae. However you say that. There are so many long Latin names here. But yeah, so switch those up just a little bit. But yeah, even though they have all those kind of different characteristics, they're all antelope because of the similarities that we see between them. But we don't have any antelope here in North America. So the very last one that we're going to talk about is sort of a common misconception and that is the pronghorn. So this right here is a pronghorn ant, a pronghorn horn. <laughs> um, and you can see it's, it's hollow here, which actually all of the horns, they're made of keratin and they grow on the bone. Um, if you were to like break them off of the bone, they'd be hollow on the inside too, but they do have bone and living tissue on the inside when the animal's alive. Um, but I mentioned all of the antelope belong to bovidae. So remember, that's a, that's a family of animals with cows, sheep, goats, and antelope. The pronghorn here in North America is part of antelocapridae. So where, where antelope, this would say bovidae, for our pronghorn, it's a different family altogether. And that's because they evolved separately and they're endemic to North America. That means they only live here. And they're not closely related to all the other antelope, even though they look similar. So the other antelope are close enough related that we're able to group them together into that wastebasket taxon of antelopes. Um, but pronghorn are completely separate. 
And one thing that kind of sets them apart is that while antelope, their horns keep growing continuously through their lives, the, um, the pronghorn sheds its horn every year. So this will grow within a year and then it'll fall off. But it's made of keratin, just like, um, just like an antelope horn which makes it a little bit different from the deer and the elk that we have here, which have antlers made of bone. All right, so that was a lot of information and I probably got some of it wrong. So if you caught anything that I said wrong, or if you have questions or clarifying questions, you're totally welcome to leave a comment and I can get back to you about them. Hopefully you did learn some cool new things though. Antelope are a huge and diverse and super fascinating group of animals and I was really excited to talk to you guys about them today. So I hope to see you next week, and I hope that you have a wonderful weekend. Bye!